All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, November 1938, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes issues a proposal that Alaska be used as a possible refuge for German Jews. This was two weeks after Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. This was the coordinated violence by Nazi forces throughout Germany. Late 1938 is this moment of severe escalation in Hitler's Germany, both militarily and culturally targeting and persecuting Jews. And amidst this all, there is this roiling question in the United States and other countries about what, if anything, to do with Jewish refugees. There was deep resistance among Congress, not to mention the public, to relaxing immigration quotas in the United States. We'll get into how complex of a situation that was. But this proposal by Ickes was sort of an attempt to get around that in a way, because Alaska was a territory, not a state. And as such, the idea was maybe it's not subject to the same immigration quotas, which no one really wants to rescind in this moment. So Ickes proposed that Alaska be used, quote, as a haven for Jewish refugees from Germany and other areas in Europe where Jews are subjected to oppressive restrictions. So here to discuss the Alaskan refugee proposal and this larger context of Jewish refugees, especially in this moment, the first years of Nazism are, as always, Nicole Hemmer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hi, Jody. Hey there. Uh, Before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to a couple cultural sort of touchstones or things that are that are out there around this. So we got a recommendation that we do this from a listener, Trevor, but he said he was reading this Michael Shabon book called The Yiddish Policeman's Union, which I haven't I haven't read. I I like Michael Shabon. I didn't, didn't even know this book existed, but it's this alternate history about lots of Jewish refugees ending up in Alaska and building a sort of huge Jewish community in Sitka, Alaska. Um, And that's the book. And then, of course, uh, there's this new documentary from Ken Burns. And I watched a couple of uh, the first two episodes of that this morning, which looks at this period. Um, But that is all about the United States and the Holocaust and the domestic response Mm -hmm. and anti-Semitism at home and all this stuff that we're going to get into. But anyway, those two things are sort of floating out there around this. And thank you, Trevor, for the recommendation. But let's look into this Icky's proposal specifically. Um, It really is like an attempt to deal with a moral, big moral question, which I do want to get into. But the specifics is this little, I don't know, do we call it a loophole? (laughs) It's a loophole. Absolutely. I mean, the U.S. had passed these extremely restrictive immigration laws just 15 years before this. Um, And there was this sentiment that the, the U.S. was kind of closed off, walled off from the rest of the world. And finding this loophole of, oh, well, if we can't have immigration to U.S. states, we could have immigration to U.S. territories. The law isn't Mm -hmm. very specific on that. So this idea that that Alaska, this gigantic landmass, would have plenty of space for German Jewish refugees was one way of trying to figure out how to make this work, given the, the immigration restrictions in the U.S., I mean, it's such a conundrum because on one hand, there are polls where 70% of Americans are disapproving of what is happening in the world and what is happening to Jewish people. And on the same hand, two thirds of Americans are like, yeah, but we don't want to change our immigration policies. We don't want them. to. Not our problem. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know, in that poll, two thirds of Americans 
still said the Jewish persecution was was the fault of the Jews in Germany. Wow. So it shows you, you know, the, yeah, it's anti-Semitism at the, at the heart of it all. And it's, I mean, this is a pattern I think that you have seen all throughout American history is that when we don't know what to do with a particular group of people, we might think something is wrong, like, we don't like slavery, but black people don't come here. Like there's, or, Mm -hmm. you know, we, same thing with Native Americans, there's always this desire to push people or put people in these marginalized spaces that won't allow us to have to deal or face the problem. And so Alaska is sort of this remote place that allows us to really deal with the problem without having to see the problem. Right. Even within this plan, which I think came from a, an effort to, you know, acknowledge the crisis and to offer a lending hand, there is still also this like, well, we'll put them up there, not not down here. Right. But not think, down here. Not not I among think, Americans. I yeah. Think part of it. Part of it was Icky's understanding the political landscape. And, you know, the quotas were basically limiting German immigrants to the United States for around 20,000 a year. Um, and even those weren't being met every year. And it was just like a gummed up system. And, you know, to obviously like the pressure on the other side was intense, especially in the weeks after Kristallnacht. By this point in 1938, I think something like half of the Jews remaining in Germany had applied for refugee mm. status in the United States. And so, you know, that's also- part of the picture we're painting here is just a, a clamor for mm. people um, saying, pleading, saying, you know, we need we need help in this moment. It's also worth noting that that 20,000 quota for Germany was one of the more generous quotas yeah. that U.S. immigration mm. law had. Um, the first version of these immigration restrictions allowed many more people in from Eastern Europe, which would be one of those places that Jews in Europe were fleeing from. But the second version of the law shifted most of the quotas to Western Germany. And so there was very little room for non-German Jews to to migrate to the United States. So even in this case, I mean, these are the the most advantaged Jewish people um, who could be immigrating to the U.S. And still there are so many barriers to making that happen. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, we tend to forget just how much those restrictions were in place, just how much the sentiment in America was very much anti-Jewish, very much anti-immigration. I think oftentimes, you know, we think of this moment as where the United States gets to be the hero and we swoop in and we save the day and we're two. But, you know, up until that moment, um, there's a huge part of history that I think does not get discussed. And that is like the the keeping out of immigrants who need help the most. Well, and... You know, I think that the Ken Burns doc does a really good job of exploring that, but also just being very plain about this is Mm anti-Semitism domestically. And it paints a picture of anti-Semitism at the heart of all of this. Right. And so you can couch it in questions about the American economy and the questions about coming out of the depression and economy and jobs and even just limiting immigration as a sort of policy. Those are all secondary to, you know, a real stark picture of anti-Semitism. And I think, you know, um, we need to grapple with that because we see the same language now, too. And you have to say, what is behind that language? Right. And it's Mm -hmm. not just we want to limit immigration. It's we want to keep a certain kind of people out of this country. And you can see that so clearly in Franklin Roosevelt's response to this proposal. He tells Ickes that First of all, we're limiting the number of refugees to 10,000 a year for five years, but also Jewish people cannot make up more than 10% of those refugees. And if it was about jobs, and if it was about competition, if it was about any of those things, there wouldn't have been that added restriction on Jewish refugees. Um, But there it was. Yeah, you know, and this this hints at, you know, you bring up FDR, this hints at, I think, a big, complicated question um, at the time, and certainly I think scholars now you know, explore this a lot, but you know, what, what was FDR's role in all of this? And, you know, a lot of the, the, the Ken Burns doc explores this and a lot of the reporting around this, and I think it's, you know, it's contested, but you know, FDR, I think the political will among Congress and a lot of it because of, you know, Southern racists was not there to relax immigration quotas. And so I think FDR at some point was navigating just a political moment. And there's lots of questions about kind of what he wanted to do versus what he could do. There was a really telling, um, moment, I think it was in 1938, where FDR sort of asked a group of congressmen and said, like, if you could vote anonymously to relax mm-hmm. uh, these immigration laws, would you? And most of them said yes. Not to sort of extend an olive branch or abdicate their moral responsibility. And part of it is you take a stand even when it's going to be yeah. um, you know, unpopular. unpopular. But I think it shows that there was just um, the political will was not there. 
Mm. You know, when I think about Alaska, I think about, I mean, it's huge, first of all. It's like the mm-hmm. largest state now. It's the largest state uh, pretty much in, in the union. But I wonder, like, there, <clears throat> there really wouldn't need to be limits put on any person that was coming into right. the territory. I mean, how, when you think of how massive and big it is, this was maybe a backward opportunity, but an opportunity still to actually do something about a very huge problem. And um, yeah. obviously this would completely change, you know, the the social and cultural um, framework of the makeup of Alaska. But I think had it been attempted in a really... Um, Magnus way in which we it, it was hoped for it could have done something really really cool yeah and Ickes was strategic when he was proposing Alaska as this place he was like you know look Alaska hasn't been developed and there aren't a ton of people who are going there so this could be a way to both provide refuge and opportunities for um, Jewish immigrants particularly with all of the laws that have been passed in Germany that have cut off professional opportunities and different types of jobs that Jewish people can get um, and they can also serve as kind of this um almost like an outpost um, for the United States in this large block of land that isn't peopled and so isn't peopled in a way the U.S. recognizes and thus isn't defended. Um, So he he, he tried to find pragmatic ways to do Mm -hmm. this, but it wasn't really able to override um, uh, U.S. resistance to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, to to be clear, like this plan does not really go anywhere. It's proposed, mm-hmm. um, but you know, as you said, FDR sort of puts up some roadblocks and doesn't really go anywhere. That's why Michael Chabon's book is an alternate history and not a history. Mm. Um, but you know, and and it is in this larger context of 1938 of the United States. Well, I guess this is really where like it's important to sort of interrogate and rethink his, this historical moment because in 1938, you know, I think one of the central questions is. Did the United States not see what was happening Mm. or did it see what was happening and then still not act? You know, Mm. and I think that the story is starting to change a little bit. And I think the the Ken Burns doc is kind of trying to do that a little bit and point out that people saw what was happening in Germany for what it was. And I think, Kelly, to your point, Mm. um, you started off by citing some of those polls in late 1938, especially in the weeks after Kristallnacht. (laughs) That that event broke through. That was on the front page of newspapers around the country. Mm-hmm. It was seen as a moral crime. And Americans, as you said, two thirds, 70 percent of Americans said this was a this was a moral crime. Mm-hmm. But still, two thirds of Americans said we should not change our immigration laws. And so there was a disconnect between seeing what was really going on and understanding what was, really, what was really going on and doing something about it. And I feel like that's the story that's you know really, I think, important to understand about 1938, 1939 and these quote unquote early years in this story. It's so important to draw a line under that because I think for decades the U.S. has sort of claimed this innocence through Mm -hmm. ignorance, right? Oh, we just didn't know. And these stories are really important indicators that more was known and less was done, um, Mm. which feels important to reintegrate into the history. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've we've talked about... We've sort of touched on this era and these kinds of stories. Before. Once we we did an episode about the so-called Ship of the Damned, which was a ship that, of Jewish refugees, about a year later, right? And now and that was stopped in Cuba, and then was not allowed to come into the U.S. And so, you know, we're trying to paint a picture here of a sort of moral crisis, and then to think that even a year later, you know, people in the United States government were not acting. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Once again, thank you to our listener, Trevor, for giving us this suggestion and recommending also, I guess, in turn, that Michael Shabon book, which I will put on my list. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure.